Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to be talking about Docker. You've wanted to hear this show for a long time. We finally got it put together. It's all about containerization to make your virtual systems work all that much better. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 330, recorded on April 1st, 2015. Docker. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEdge.com, bringing you each week, or as often as I can, pretty close to each week, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you may want to download right after this show and start playing with. I believe today's will be one of those, unless you're already using it quite a ways. And uh, I'm slowly waking up. I just flew back in from the East Coast, and I'm back here in Silicon Rainforest trying to wake up desperately to do this show. Uh, but I am back, and we also have back uh, one of our frequent co-hosts, uh, Gareth Greenaway. Gareth, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here. And and, and where are you speaking to us from? I'm in uh, Southern California. It's uh, nice and sunny and warm today. Um, our typical March weather. Yeah, I'll be back there in uh, be back there. I think in a couple days. We're back down there working for my uh, client down there, and I think you'll see the big green tree on the back of the screen next week. So that's pretty good. Well, the show's not about us. The show is about open source software. Today we have the show that we have uh, really been wanting to get on for a long time. Uh, it's Docker. Docker is an amazing piece of technology being used more and more uh, to help do uh, cloud rollouts and, and testing and development and continuous integration. Lots of really great things. And we have none other than Solomon Hikes is going to be speaking to us about that. He's the CTO of the company that is managing Docker and making it available for all of us. Uh, what do you know about Docker, Gareth? Um, I've, I've just been playing around with it the last, um, I would say, month or so. Um, but, I mean, yeah, like you said, it, it's one of the up-and-coming um, really big name software that everyone is talking about. I, I don't think you can you can walk 10 feet within a, a group of, of technology fans and not hear a conversation about Docker in some way. Well, just like at scale, a few weeks ago, with, I was down there with you hanging out for, for scale. And uh, we were... Um we were, I mean, I think you, there was like all these booths. And I think like every third booth said Docker some way or another. So uh, it's definitely the up and coming thing. Well, you know, we could sit him and haw about it for a long time, but I think we should probably bring on the experts. Let's go ahead and bring Solomon Hikes on. Welcome to the show, Solomon. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Cool. And where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm in San Francisco in my house. So we got an entirely West Coast show here for a change. We're all in the same time zone. That's pretty good. Although if we did the show last week, I would not have been. So it's a good thing we're doing it this week. So I gave sort of my little my little brief introduction, but I'm sure you can do a much better 30,000 foot view uh, overview of what Docker is and what problem it's trying to solve. So uh, please do. Sure. So uh, Docker is uh, open source software. It's a, it's a simple tool that you install on any Linux machine, uh, hopefully soon any Windows machine. And uh, what it does is it helps developers package up their applications in a format that is uh, easy to move around from machine to machine and then can be executed in a sandbox environment uh, in a repeatable way, meaning it, the same thing happens on any of those machines or at least something predictable happens. And that gives developers a really useful building block um, to assemble applications, uh, especially what we call distributed applications. So applications that are made of uh, multiple software components talking to each other over the network across many machines, right? So clouds, backends, uh, web applications, things like that. Um, and yeah, that's what Docker does. Well, that sounds like a, a problem that's been solved many times. What's what's different about Docker that makes it uh, the new cool thing that all the kids want to get into? Yeah, so <laughs> um, I think, well, a few reasons, I think. Uh, the, the first is that uh, the... the um, well, first of all, the technology has existed um, for a while, although it, it matured fairly recently. So Linux containers, et cetera, uh, Linux containers are 
one of the building blocks on top of which Docker is built. We did not invent that. Um, one thing that is new in how Docker approaches it, though, is instead of thinking of it as a low-level building block for um, sysadmins to start servers, uh, you know, instead of thinking of containers as just miniature servers, VMs that start more quickly, instead we looked at it and said, oh, we could use this and uh, make it available to developers for, for uh, their needs. And you know, I just explained that the need package up your application and move it around. Um, so that's been done before, but um, usually in a very language specific or platform specific way. So if I'm a Java developer, I've got JAR. I can package up my Java application and move it around, no problem. If I'm a Python developer, I've got uh, PyPy to distribute my, um, my packages. I've got pip install, I've got a whole setup. Uh, if I'm using Ruby, I've got gems, et cetera. So each stack has its own proprietary dedicated tools. The problem is that um, these new kinds of applications, these distributed applications that are typically what developers are building today um, are not limited to one of those language stacks. Typically over time you have pieces in many different languages. You want to mix and match. Um, you know, you want to expose each functionality as a service. You want to you don't want other components to worry about which language it's written in. Uh, and that's just what developers do. The problem is if that's the scope of your application, then you don't really have a building block for packaging all the pieces in the same way across your entire application. And uh, Docker does that because it's not language specific. Um, it's, its abstraction layer is focused on things that are true across all Unix -E systems, processes, files, uh, sockets, things like that. So it's agnostic. Cool. And I think one thing that I see so far in Docker that makes it really different from how at least companies I've been working for have been doing this is that rather than go through, say, using the Perl CPAN tools or, or using uh, uh, the, the Linux packaging stuff, rather than go through um, uh, each individual um, uh, VM and install everything there, uh, we instead do, um, uh, you install it all once and you get this binary that you can then layer onto your basic stack. So you're doing the installation expense only once. Is that is that a fair way to characterize that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, what the, the if you if you know what a static binary is, you know, the, the approach is to compile everything in and then move the whole thing around. Uh, um, you know, there's Docker helps developers bundle. And uh, sometimes it creates frictions because... Um, the typical way that um, a Linux distro sysadmin wants to install and manage software is the opposite, right? It's, it's centered around the workflow of the operator uh, and the ability to actually change on the fly dynamic libraries and change, change some dependencies under the feet of the application. Uh, and so there's an emphasis on control and... Um, kind of only making changes when you're sure you know exactly what's going to happen. Um, meanwhile, the developer is um, preoccupied with a different kind of control. If I'm a developer and I've built my application on my machine and it works, uh, it works when I've built it on a very specific version of different libraries, right? And I, it works because it's hitting a very specific version of uh, my favorite database, et cetera. Uh, the configuration is done in a very specific way. All of that is part of my application, really, because if I change it, the application might not work or it might work differently. So what I want as a developer is I want to package all of that and I want to distribute all of that together. I don't want people to mess around with it because if people mess around with it downstream, it's not my application anymore. Uh, so that's how, for example, iOS and Android apps are, are built. And it's been very successful because applications don't interfere with each other with each other you don't have you know what used to be called uh, dll hell right or we call it the matrix from hell same codes on different machines with different dependencies different results here it's always the same thing uh, and that's very appealing to developers and it results in applications that are more predictable the, the quality is better you can ship faster etc so uh, is it a fair assessment to kind of uh, can, can to continue along the, that line of thought that you were going on, um, 
that traditionally when when a, a production or even like a, a, in like QA environments, for example, uh, applications are deployed, it's usually it falls on the um, the system administrator to kind of handle the configuration. The the concept of Docker kind of shifts that so that now the the developer is is solely responsible for the the both the deployment and the configuration of that said application. Is that is that a fair assessment? Um, I- so it, it's true that some, um, some aspects of the work, it definitely does shift the line between uh, developers and ops, let's call it, you know, between dev and ops, let's call it that. Um, it definitely affects the relationship between the two. And actually, that's a feature. Uh, what it does, we call it separation of concerns. Um, the reality today of the interaction between dev and ops is that it's not that great. Um, in spite of best intentions, it's very complicated to have a clean separation of concerns where developers can do their work and focus on what they're supposed to do, and ops can do their work and focus on what they're supposed to do. Um, there's a blurry spectrum in, in between, right? And, and so one example is maybe um, the ops team has standardized on a configuration management system and, a, and a, uh, an orchestration system, so there's a bunch of tools out there. Um, and, you know, Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible, something like that, or, um, you know, Mesos or uh, a bunch of, I don't know, I'm, I'm throwing names out there, but the names aren't important. Uh, these tools are focused on operational workflow, right? How machines are going to be provisioned, how they're going to be configured, how they're going to be kept up to date, et cetera. And the typical workflow is that ops, the ops team does that, they set up their tools and then the, the scope of these tools kind of continues into uh, the realm of the developer because if you've got this tool that configures all the, the machine and then configures all the software on the machine, uh, it decides which version of which package is installed, et cetera, that affects the application, right? Because now that tool is determining which version of Ruby my Ruby app is going to be using and which version of uh, my favorite image processing package is going to be used, uh, me being the developer, right? Uh, and so now you have, you, you have a requirement that both teams work in lockstep together, and they're both interacting with the same configuration. The line is not clear because they're, they're all, at the end of the day, sharing the responsibility of controlling what bits are installed on that machine. Uh, what happens with containers is all of a sudden you've got that line. The things inside the container are the developer's responsibility. The things outside the container, on the machine which runs the containers, you still need the machine underneath the containers, uh, is ops responsibility. And now the interference between the two is limited. The interface is clear and well-defined. And the analogy we use a lot, which works surprisingly well, is the shipping container analogy. I mean, if you heard of Docker, we use that a lot. (laughs) Uh, And it, it really sticks. Um, you know, the whole point of the shipping container is I put stuff in it, I close the door. Now it's no one else's problem what's inside. Uh, but now because the shape of the box is standardized, I can hand that box to a large number of, uh, infrastructure providers, right? Cranes, boats, I can store them in warehouses, you know, whatever. Uh, so the people who deal with what's inside the box are the developers. The people who move the boxes around with, with the equipment of their choice are, that's ops. And that's that's how we we approach it. It does um, it does cause some you know it does open a lot of questions when when people start rolling out Docker uh, at larger scale. Usually, it causes them to rethink their architecture, think rethink how they they build and ship software end to end, right? Um, but um, usually, that's well, it's one of the reasons they want to use Docker. They want to rethink it because they're not satis- they're not satisfied with with what they have. Uh, so that's actually a good lead into my my next question. Um, so one of the the things that I've noticed um, in in when I've been playing around with Docker is is kind of breaking that mentality of once you once you've spun up a a Docker container, thinking to yourself like, okay, I have to log in to do stuff to this container. And then, like stopping yourself and thinking, like, no, no, I don't do that. I have to. I do it this way. I, I, I if I need to make a change here, I basically destroy that container and then recreate it in, with the changes that I want. Um, how, 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 how have you guys kind of 
educated people in terms of of making sure that they that they follow that mentality versus like the the traditional okay treating treating those containers as simply VMs. Yeah. So there's two things. There's there's the 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 there's a very specific and deliberate approach to that problem, and you're totally right. There's once you start using Docker, it opens the possibility of a new architecture where instead of having one machine that boots and has all the, all the different pieces of the application um, mixed together, the database, the, the middleware, the front end, et cetera, and then later um, logical separation of these components only happens when you're scaling to multiple machines. It opens up the possibility of a model where each logical component is already separated, um, you know, one component per container, even if they all are on the same machine, because containers are basically free. There is virtually zero performance overhead, and and that's the whole point. Um, it makes it useful as a logical unit of separation, something that's not possible with VMs, or at least not practical, because VMs are not free. Um, especially when you're developing or in your low-scale environments, it's very obvious that if you've got a 20-component application, booting 20 VMs on your laptop to test it is going to be really tricky. So there's definitely that new architecture, um, and our goal is definitely to make it easier for new applications to adopt that architecture because we think it's better. But uh, at the same time, a very deliberate um, concept in, in how we're um, de designing Docker and, and um, I'm going to say evangelizing it is that you should not feel forced to adopt that architecture on day one. And actually, you might use Docker for applications that will never adopt that architecture or only partially. And, um, and that's a key concept because we did not invent this architecture, right? Um, we, we've adopt, we used to follow that architecture ourselves in our previous product, .cloud. So a, you know, a platform as a service. We hosted other people's applications, and the, the product used, .cloud used that architecture. Right? And it's, it's, a very, it's a popular one. Um, but the problem we saw with all the existing tools and platforms, and including our own, was that it was all or nothing. You had to adopt this new architecture before you could even get any of the value. Uh, and the real world doesn't work that way. There's applications that are never going to, they're just there. The people who wrote them are long gone, so you can't rewrite them. They're critical for your operations. Um, but it would be great to have them packaged in a way that's repeatable. So if the machine dies, you can redeploy, right? It would be great to have some uh, streamlined way to collect the logs from all of them. Um, so that the point of Docker is to not force you to do it. So as a result of that, sorry, my answer is kind of long, but I'm trying to be uh, accurate. Um, as a result of that, we have two communities within the Docker community. Uh, you got people who are using them uh, in, in trying to go as far as possible in this new architecture, and people who are using them for very tactical uh, benefits, right? immediate benefits, low-hanging fruits. And our approach is to say, that's fine. Now, there's been some debate within the community, and, and there's been a lot of um, blog posts and arguments, um, and the line of reasoning, it's very subtle, is usually focused on, you're doing it wrong on each side. And I wish that didn't happen as much. Uh, so I feel like, even though that was the deliberate approach in the beginning, because there's so much going on around Docker, that's been lost a little bit. So we're trying to kind of remind everybody, hey, it's it's okay that we're not all using Docker in the same way. So I'm sort of curious now because um, you, you, you'd mentioned exactly the situation that my primary client right now is, is forcing me to do. We have a web server stack and we have a database stack. And for testing purposes, they're making me fire up two virtual boxes on my, my puny little laptop. And it drives me nuts because it's like, why couldn't you just run these both in the same virtual machine so that I can just have one VM fired up. Does that mean if you're moving to an architecture like Docker, I could have like two of these containers essentially running on one VM on my yeah. laptop and then but deploy it to two different machines in reality when it's finally live? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and that's 
um, that's one of the big benefits is that you can do that and you have, um, you have a reasonable assurance that the, the same, it'll be the same thing running in both instances, right? So you can, it, for example, especially around a um, continuous delivery or you know, anything that looks like a conveyor belt, right? Where the, there's different steps and you're developing and you're testing, you go to staging, you go to QA, and then you go to production, et cetera. Uh, you've got the same software components moving through that, that conveyor belt and at each step of the conveyor belt, they're going to be running on different machines and different configurations. And in your example, step one of the conveyor belt is your laptop. And step two might be three servers in production, right? Um, mm -hmm. The containers should be the same. And the, um, you're going to want to run integration tests, unit tests uh, at step one. And you want to, if the tests pass there, you want to be able to say, if the tests pass here, I'm reasonably confident that uh, they're going to pass in production. And that's, that's basically, that's, that's the fundamental property of, of, of Docker, that it lets you um, make that assumption. Instead of, well, it worked on my virtual box, I, I sure hope it's the same version of Python in production, because otherwise, who knows what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's part of also every, every you know, morning when I want to start up, I have to run this sync script that pulls in or some random number of new Perl modules, some random number of Python things, and maybe upgrades some of the, the, the live C stuff. And, and it's, it's always, it, it's like, it, it, for one thing, it kills like five to 10 minutes of my productivity because sometimes that script gets stuck because it works for some people's machines, but not other people's virtual machines, which is also a mystery to me. We had one of those in production recently where somehow I couldn't bring my system up to date. Now, now what does this look like from a developer's perspective though. So I'm, I've got these virtual containers up and running and now I want to be writing code and I'm doing it via an NFS mounted uh, file system on my main laptop. Uh, mm -hmm. Where does that ultimately get captured back and described so that Docker will pull that version of the code I've just finished? Yeah. So there's, there's a facility that Docker provides that's, that it's optional, but it's, it's kind of what we recommend as a starting point for the developer flow. So if you're, um, Editing source codes in a Git repository somewhere. It doesn't have to be Git. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you want to deploy it into a container. The idea is that you build a container from source. Uh, and, and so that's definitely more in line with this new architecture where you say, instead of saying, I'm going to set up a, a machine, and then I'm going to log in, and I'm going to upload my code into it. And then later, I'll log in again and upload the new version of the code into it. We're flipping it around and saying, uh, a container is not like a server. It's like a binary. It's something you build from source. And so what we provide is a facility called a Docker file. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a, a little text file that you drop into your source repository. Uh, and it specifies, it lets you specify exactly how you want this source code to be transformed into a container. And so it's, it's a very simplistic syntax. And in fact, people complain a lot that it's, it's too simple. They want it to be more powerful. Um, but the whole point is it's, it's the simplest possible thing. Uh, and then you can always call scripts if you have a favorite scripting language. If you've got a make file, for example, right? Or uh, whatever custom build setup you have, um, you can, you, your Docker file can specify um, how to set up your build environments, and then it can hand off to your, your build environment. Except now, instead of building in whatever happens to be installed on your computer at the time, the, the, you're building in a very specific environment, right? And so there's a concept of base, base image and images where you can say, start from, this, from that other container over there, which, uh, which I built previously or someone else built. Because I know what version of I know what's what's your what's your language? You mentioned Perl before. I know which version of Perl is installed in there, and I know which packages are pre-installed, and it's it's the setup I like. And from there, now add this this source repository into, you know, slash home uh, slash my account slash uh, app. Then once you've done that, run the following command: uh, gcc blah blah blah. Right. Uh, then mm -hmm. run this command, cpan install an additional thing that I want to use, right? And so all of this, it's a very simple script uh, language. Uh, tip, a typical Docker file is 5 to 20 lines long. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and once you have it, you, you, when you want to build a new container, you type Docker build and, and that's it. You get a new container. And, and uh, do you then layer systems like, uh, like maybe Puppet or Salt or something on top of this to get configuration information for coordinated machines? Because obviously the IP addresses that are on my laptop are not the IP addresses in production. So how do these guys find out about each other? Yeah. So now you're entering the topic of orchestration, which is the big topic in the Docker community right now. Because one, what happens is once you've got a container and then you get a second container, you get a third, and they need to talk to each other, um, and they need to be deployed together as a whole. Now you get into the, the problem of orchestration. And um, what we've done is with the early versions of Docker, we said we leave orchestration as an exercise to the reader. Uh, <laughs> and, the reason, and the reason we did that is we reasoned that was as a reaction to our previous approach with .cloud. And um, the approach of most of the tools out there, which is to say, we will handle everything for you always. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, don't look into this. So you have these big monolithic systems that handle all of it, all the orchestration, all the, the build, uh, the deployment, the runtime, the collecting the logs, giving you metrics, uh, interconnecting the containers. And what happens is you start with everything, and eventually you want to customize a little piece. And then it's really hard because it's designed to be the entire thing. And it turns out most people need to customize something. Uh, so the metaphor I like to use for this is Lego, right? Um, why is Lego such a popular toy? At least it was. I don't know if you can still play Lego. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard Minecraft is kind of taking over, but you know, why is it so popular? Because you can deconstruct and reconstruct in every way you want, right? So, but you, you, the pirate ship's awesome. But what's really awesome is you can then later turn it into a half pirate ship, half spaceship. Um, and so that was our approach. The trade-off is that um, at any given point, you might need to glue, add some of your custom glue yourself because we're not done adding the new pieces, right? Uh, but so we found that that's a better trade-off. We would better have someone say, oh, gee, I wish there was a convenient way to interconnect containers for me. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to do it myself or I'm, I'm going to pick from these five existing tools in the ecosystem that, are, that integrate with Docker. And then um, later we might add a standard piece if, if enough people ask for it. So in your example, uh, interconnection of containers were exactly at that phase where we introduced new uh, companion tools that are still in beta, and uh, they're still not fully integrated into Docker, so you're free to take them and experiment. Uh, and there's one called Docker Swarm, which lets you deploy, uh, run a container across multiple machines, and to you it looks like one machine. So it basically takes care of installing Docker on all 10 machines, for example, and then that looks like one, one machine, and you do, you, you do Docker run, and it will take care of dispatching containers at the right place. Um, the, the problem you mentioned of, hey, I've got these three containers, I want to organize them, and they're one thing. Uh, there's another tool called Docker Compose, which lets you um, describe how your containers work together. And, and then you type a command, and it, it's going to build and run all three for you. Um, so that's, that's the answer. Uh, basically, the answer is there's probably a tool for it, but because of our bias towards smaller, more modular tools, sometimes you have to go and look for it um, and, and assemble things yourself. But, but that's what the Docker community likes. They like the flexibility. So one of the questions that we had from the, the chat room um, was specifically around um, like deployments and, and getting those, those containers out into like a production environment. Um, we using like if if an organization was to use Docker, does that fall on the on the developer, or is that falling still on the operation side of things? Uh, a production deployment of of Docker containers. Yes. Yeah. So that's definitely the responsibility of ops, and it's the same philosophy there. Our starting point was to say, um, and again, the the context is 2013. Um, we're running a, uh, a hosted service called .cloud. 
and we've been running it for three plus years. And what that that uh, product does is it runs people's applications in containers, right? And so, and we make sure the containers run properly. So we did that job for other people, and Doc Cloud served maybe a hundred million monthly uniques uh, for a lot of apps that are typically smaller, medium in size. So lots of containers, right? So that 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 platform that we ran deployed many millions of containers, uh, and so what all the problems that we ran into informed the design of Docker. And, and when we say that, a lot of people are surprised. They say, well, if that's the case, how come I still have to do all, all this extra work to get to use it in production? Like, I, I can't just install Docker on, on, on 10 machines and boom, I got this magical ultra scalable thing. Where's the magical ultra scalable thing? And our answer is there is no such thing because production is complicated, production is messy. And to run something serious in production, you're going to have to do some work. Uh, and when you're going to be doing that work, the last thing you want is this big bulky tool that pretends to do anything, everything magically because it's definitely not true. So our approach is to say, well, here's one building block. Uh, before Docker existed, you still had to glue all these things together. Now you still have to, you still have to glue a lot of things together, but not as many things. And it's easier because at least you have this building block. So, for example, um, we mentioned orchestration. Now we're beginning to offer more standardized tools to complement Docker with Swarm and Compose. Uh, there's another one called Docker Machine. But it's still early. Uh, so, yeah, if you're running Docker in production today, you've got a lot of glue. And uh, you're probably using other tools out there that, that um, do the parts that Docker doesn't do. But we try really hard to offer interfaces to allow that. So it's, it's part of the design that you should be able to connect your own pieces, right? And um, so we're, for, we're constantly looking for ways to fix the bugs in Docker and make it more stable and constantly looking for the next most useful feature. But at the same time, we're also looking for the next most useful API to connect with other tools that do what Docker doesn't do. So there's things like logging, storage, um, you know, security, monitoring, um, things like that. So yes, you can use Docker in production. No, you can't use Docker out of the box without any extra work in production. Okay. Uh, so one of the things I was thinking about when you were you were um, talking with Randall about kind of from him as a like a developer side of things. Kind of ensuring that um, certain versions of, of a, a language, for example, Ruby, were installed on within a container, like specifically for an application. One of the uses a lot of people use um, like configuration management for is to ensure that there's a consistency across their environment for for whatever reason, for security reasons, um, for just general consistency. Is there a mechanism within Docker to ensure, so like say you had a, a specific application or a specific set of applications and you wanted to ensure that they were all running within the same version of, of Ruby, for example. Is yeah. there a way within Docker to ensure that all of your containers are, are standardized on, on specific tools? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a core part of Docker. Um, every time you build a container image, what we call a container image is basically um, a, a packaged version of that, you know, a, a package that can be used to create any number of containers from the exact same starting point. So it's basically a bunch of tarballs with uh, metadata and then a versioning system to, to, to make it more lightweight to update and move it around. Um, and each of those images has a unique ID and you can, you can get a hash of its content. Um, and Docker doesn't have a concept of Ruby want point, whatever, right? So it won't tell you you have this version of Ruby because from a deployment point of view, version is a very, um, in, it's not a precise concept. Uh, a lot of different binaries qualify as, uh, you know, uh, I don't know the versions of Ruby, but what? One point, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to use Python because I know Python better. You know, a lot of binaries out there qualify as Python 3, right? Um, 
Python 3, the development branch, Python 3 as built by Red Hat or Ubuntu, Python 3 I, that I built myself after checking it out with a different version of GCC, like who knows? Um, and so the, the, to broaden that, that concept, we're saying when it comes to being sure that it's exactly the same thing that's running across all these machines, it's not enough to say, oh, I installed it from, I typed install Python, whatever. Um, the only thing the only thing I will tell you for sure that it's the same thing running is that it's but if it's if the files inside the sandbox are byte for byte identical, the hash is actually the same, and so that's that's our starting point. So um, Docker is very agnostic to what goes inside the container, how it was downloaded, um, but it's very precise about what's the result, what's the hash, what's the ID, and so the way you would do that is you would say, okay, I built this image. I know that what's in there is what I want. And I know the ID is this long random string. And so now I'm going to make sure all these servers are running their, a container from that exact image ID, the same everywhere. And, and that gives you a clean, predictable starting point for the, for, to answer the question, what is running? Okay. So, I mean, as far as like the, my, my general question, it, it's still... On the, um, it, it's still on the, the side of the organization to ensure that that there, there's communication in terms of what standards should be followed. Yeah, so Docker gives you a tool to express to express it, and it, so it gives you a new vocabulary in a way, right? And then it's still up the other or up the, to the organization to use that vocabulary to uh, talk. Um, okay. So in, in the context of config management, you could say. Um, uh, well, a lot of people who use config management heavily end up with the way they insert Docker is they use it as a sort of an intermediary representation, right? So for example, I'm deploying an app on 100 servers and I'm building with, you know, Chef or Puppet uh, and the, the, the build file, the recipe says, install this package, install this, do this, do this, do this. Um, one typical problem at scale is that uh, every time there's a deploy, that's 100 different machines executing the same script some of these scripts, these, these build recipes, some of these build recipes involve downloading stuff from the internet, executing commands that have side effects. So the results may not be the same. One problem we have when doing that at Doc Cloud is maybe you're running a build and 80 out of the hundreds uh, nodes are done building. And then right there, there's a discrepancy in rubygems.org or in CPAN and they update. Uh, and they, they, they get it wrong and it's the same tag, but it's not the same content anymore. Or maybe they go down, they get DDoSed, right? Um, now, the last 20 nodes will be built with different content. You've got an inconsistent build. So that's a very typical problem um, for large Chef or Puppet or other configuration management users. Uh, the other problem being these builds are very CPU intensive. So that's a lot of work for a lot of machines that could be done once. So instead, they insert, they, they keep the configuration management, but they just insert this intermediary step where first they build it, same recipe, same everything, except then they capture the result in the container, and then they just distribute the container on 100 machines. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions, uh, another question from the, the chat room um, was specifically around um, volume data saving. Um, so the question is, is there a AUFS type File storage for volumes, not container, not container ah, data. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of conversation about that on the development channel. Uh, so my first answer would be to anyone uh, talking about Docker and curious about learning more in IRC. I really encourage you guys to show up on the Docker channel and the Docker Dev Docker Dash Dev channel on Freenode because that's really where all these discussions happen. But the answer for volumes is um, the internals are there. The API and UI to do that are still limited. I'm not satisfied with them. We're talking about the best way to revamp them. But yes, definitely, it should be possible. And the, the, the secret is that right now, even though in the UI and API it's not possible, you can't actually say store this volume in the same way that you store that container or root file system. It, at the lower levels of the internals of Docker, it is in fact stored using the same storage subsystem. So we have this system internally. Earlier I said we're trying to look for APIs to make things pluggable and 
uh, allow for integration. One example is storage. So we have this internal API called storage drivers. Sometimes they're called graph drivers. That's confusing. Um, and that's, that's the API that lets you, uh, that lets a developer um, implement a new way to store containers, right? And it's especially interesting because cop we need copy on write to allow for rapid uh, snapshotting and copies of containers. And so there's many file systems out there that do that. There's many different facilities. There's AUFS, there's OverlayFS, there's ButterFS, et cetera. We have a driver for each. Um, one of the drivers that exists that almost nobody uses for containers, usually they use AUFS or ButterFS or Device Mapper, um, is one that would be called VFS, which is basically don't do anything special. Just create a directory. And when asked to copy, just copy the whole thing. So you don't get any of the benefits of uh, copy and write. Uh, a, a copy is a full copy, so it takes time. It, does, it, it uses twice this, the disk space, so you understand why most people don't use it as the default. Um, it's very useful in, in large-scale production deployments where ops don't trust all that weird kernel stuff, and they just want something with... Uh, they, they don't want any additional um, middleman in the code path. So they don't want a weird um, file system in there. So they use that. Uh, but the other way we use that is for volumes. So really, every time you create a volume uh, for the underlying storage layer, it's the same construct. A root file system for your container and a volume are actually just two items in the, the same long list of storage objects, except one is created with the VFS driver. And the limit today is in the code of Docker, if it's a volume, we say, always use VFS. You can't choose. But there's no reason you can't be able to choose. We just have to, we just have to do the work. <laughs> so one of the but things except, like... Except pull requests. Oh, sorry. no, sorry. Uh, what was that? Uh, I just said we accept pull requests. We, we welcome contributions. So oh, awesome. Hopefully we inspire uh, so someone. One of the popular things, one of the reasons like people love um, virtual machines is it is allows you to run an architecture or an operating system completely different from what your your host operating system or host architecture is. How does how does Docker come into play with that? Yeah, so Docker doesn't doesn't do that. Uh, well, it, the the Linux containers technology that Docker manages does not do that. So um, on a given machine, when you're going to start lots of different containers. The starting point was to say there's this really clean separation. It's sandboxed. It's completely isolated. One application is isolated from the other, except for the kernel. Right? The kernel is the one remaining dependency. Um, it's practical because uh, because today in a typical Linux deployment environment, the the exact version and configuration of your kernel does not matter. And for those cases where it matters. Um, that's a small enough um, sample that you can treat them as special cases. That's our, that was our starting point as an approach, right? So um, it also works because the, uh, Linux is extremely good at uh, backwards compatibility. They're really serious about not breaking applications ever. And because of that, um, we don't have a situation where you know, an application worked on... 3.2, but it's not going to work on 4.0. Right? That just does. We can assume it doesn't happen. Um, now, another problem is, in the same way that uh, your distributed application is now typically made of lots of different pieces um, that may use different languages, different frameworks, different stacks. Um, increasingly, we're seeing that um, that also includes different operating systems. And that's mostly because people are realizing, oh, this, this entire distributed system is my application, right? Um, and, you know, if your typical application is, I've got a mobile app that my, my customer is using, and it's, you know, it hits a, a REST API that um, hits an analytics uh, component over here and a database there, and also uh, my billing system. Which, uh, which I've developed many years ago, and uh, there's an integration. So you have old components, new components. There's a lot of windows in the picture a lot of times. There's a lot of Solaris in the picture. Um, and so the problem is that 
currently Docker cannot help you. Uh, it definitely cannot run Solaris zones and, and Linux containers and whatever Windows is going to ship in Windows 10 on the same machine, right? That, that's, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, our goal, though, is to, um, is to let you install Docker on each of those machines. So what we want is for you to be able to install Docker on all your Windows servers, on all your Linux servers, and all your Solaris servers, and then using um, these standard APIs and the standard tooling that we're developing, right? Uh, standard way to get logs out of a container, standard way to tell a container to start or stop, right? Standard way to check for the next version of a container. These things uh, are portable, right? Uh, so you have, ideally, you have the Windows deployment running the Windows containers, the Solaris deployment running the Solaris containers, the Linux deployment running the Linux containers. They're different. They're not interchangeable. Um, but you can manage them with a unified set of tools because the interfaces are the same. That's the goal. Uh, can I also put in a request there for FreeBSD jails? That would be handy. Yeah, actually, FreeBSD, I should have mentioned it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there was, you know, if every, every other month someone shows up on RC and says, I'm going to do free, FreeBSD jails support, and they write this crazy patch and we try to help them. <laughs> um, and I know, and then they, they they go away. So I, I, or maybe we we drop them. Like, I don't know. The, the one problem we have right now is it's a very active project. Uh, yes. You know, I think you mentioned earlier. It's it's if you're in tech, it's it's hard not to hear about Docker. That has its downsides. Um, you know, engineers don't like hype. I'm always uncomfortable when you know you hear too much about you know. Just it's too much, right? The it sets the expectation too high. Uh, so it, you feel stressed out, like, oh, so many people are talking about it. Well, we better not screw up. We better, we better fix those bugs. Uh, but the, a, another effect of that is there's a lot of users. A lot of people use Docker. Uh, but a lot of people also contribute to Docker. It's a very, very active open source project. And so as a result, we get lots of patches. And you know, these IRC channels that I talked about are very, very busy. I think there's 2,000 people on, on the user channel and 200 on the development channel, right? And we, we, I think we process about 100 patches uh, a week. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of patches. So the problem is we have a scale, we have a scale problem, right? We're, we're trying to find more efficient ways to um, welcome so many contributors in a constructive way, right? You, um, and it's, it's not easy. So sometimes people well, so, get started, they get excited, and then you know their patch gets dropped, and they they just they they get disappointed and they give up. So that's we try to avoid that as much as possible. Maybe if you containerize the developers the same way you scaled by using containers with Docker, it would work. Well, we developed Docker with Docker. <laughs> so that's a start. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, also, I'm sort of curious now. Uh, um, Docker is obviously a, a collection of programs that are running. Uh, natively in Linux and, and possibly, I guess, in Windows as well. Um, what, what's, what's it all written in? What's behind the scenes here? So it's all written in Go. Um, and that was a, another important decision we made early on. It was very, a very conscious decision. The same way we decided, okay, it's, it, we're going to allow for different people to use it differently. We also said we're going to write in Go, even though Go is not completely proven yet. This is in 2013. It was definitely not an experimental language anymore, but it was pretty young, and it was not nearly as hyped as it was today. Mm -hmm. um, and previously, all, all of our stuff was in Python. So Docker was a rewrite in Go of the core technology, the core tools that we had developed for our previous uh, product in Python. Um, yeah, so it's all Go. It's cool. Okay. And uh, I just saw this uh, blurb on KiteMatic. You want to describe what that is? Yeah. So KiteMatic is uh, a really awesome tool uh, that was written by um, three, three, um, three alumni of, a, of um, uh, what's it called? The Waterloo University in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a GUI for Docker on Mac. So there's a lot of developers want to build their applications using Docker. They, they heard what it can do. They're really excited, but they're not super comfortable with the command line or they find the command line cryptic. Um, 
And although we try to keep it simple, I can't blame them. Uh, and Kitematic gives you a, a, a native Mac application. You open it, and it, it, it you have this cool graphical interface. It shows you containers. It gives you an interface to create new containers really easily. Um, and they're working on porting it to Windows, and I think having a web version at some point also. So it, it's really cool. And and we're um, we've we've hired the team, so we're sponsoring them to keep working on it. And we're looking at ways to integrate to have a more standardized GUI for, for Docker. So we're, it's possible in the future, if you install, if you follow, the, if you install the official Docker bundle, you might get a GUI in there that you're free to use or not. I don't know. We're still figuring it out. Oh, I think Randall may have dropped off. Oh, um, oops. So, oh. Randall, are you still there? But I didn't hear the in the middle half of the answer. Didn't hear the middle yeah. half of the answer. So it's okay. Uh, I, I, we're almost out of time, though, so I want to wrap up with just a couple more quick questions. Uh, where is Docker headed? Who decides the roadmap? And uh, are you taking input on that? I mean, like, like FreeBSD jails. Uh, of course, that's probably all going to come from pull requests and things. But uh, how do you decide what's the future for Docker? And, and what yeah. is there? So good question. Um, early on, we kind of said, okay, we're going to try to do this in a really open way. And we did open source before, uh, but you know it was it was kind of the more traditional company open source is a project. Everyone's free to send patches, but mostly if you don't work at the company, it's not your project. Uh, with Docker, we said no, it's going to be a real open source project like Linux, and and so that means if you worked at the company you were not free to just modify the, the code, right? You had to go through this process. You had to go into the mailing list and argue for it, send a pull request. So we have a maintainer system. Um, maintainers, um, we're, we're, we're trying to follow on Linux's footsteps and, and, and we add some um, modifications of our own along the way. But mm -hmm. basically the answer is uh, everyone can participate and it doesn't matter where you work. Uh, it doesn't matter what your expertise is. It's not just about Linux containers. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, help we need um, in UI and APIs, uh, code cleanup, documentation, uh, a lot of things, right? There's a lot of networking code in there. There's a lot of storage. Um, so the answer is anyone who's willing and able should be able to become a core contributor, a core maintainer, um, so all that happens on IRC and the only message I can send is if you feel like it's, 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 you're trying, but you're not getting there, then it's, it's the scale problem. It's just, we, we, there's so much going on and there's, it's a relatively small group of people. Uh, we definitely need a lot of help. Um, so the answer is, um, the, the open, the, the roadmap and the processes are completely open. The, the rules by which the project itself is governed is in the GitHub repo. So the way you ch the way we discuss governance of the project and who gets to, to decide what, et cetera, that itself uh, is discussed by pull requests and, and code review, which is pretty cool. So the, the human organization itself cool. that produces the code is code. That's, that's awesome. Uh, so how does Docker Inc. make its money then? Uh, very simple. Well, uh, I hope it'll be very simple. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I honestly, I, so, you know, I've been doing this for, for a while. I started this company in 2007. And, um, you know, I, I really believe that the company is a vehicle for making the product successful. Mm -hmm. And it's got to make money. And I'm, not, I'm definitely not in the camp of, uh, you know, business is icky, uh, open source uh, zealots. But I, I believe that, you know, revenue is like, it's not a goal in itself. It's, it's how you keep going. It's like the air you breathe, right? You got to yeah. make money yeah. in a healthy way so you can keep producing uh, good code. Uh, and so we're adopting a, a layered model. The company's purpose is to make the project successful. Um, the, the company is responsible for um, providing resources to the project, paying for people to work on it full time, providing infrastructure like tools and hosting and things like that. And in return, the company gets to um, sell things to the people using Docker that are helpful to the project. So selling support is uh, helpful because the more comfortable uh, organizations are using Docker, the more 
um, the more successful the project will be, right? Training is useful because the more people are trained and using Docker properly, the more successful they'll be using it uh, and the better off the project is. Uh, cloud services are good because if I'm using Docker everywhere uh, and I think, oh, I, I, it would be cool to have a place to store my containers and share them with others, I could do it myself. But if someone um, took my money to do it uh, and it was reliable and fast, then I would use that. So uh, Docker Inc. sells these things. And it also accepts that other people might sell these things. And that's okay because, you know, we, we started the project, we're named after the project. Um, enough organizations in the world will consider us uh, and, um, you know, take a look at our product and use them if they're good. That, you know, that the, the model works for us. So it's, cool. a, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, and that's the whole point. Uh, so I had one final question. Um, what is the most interesting thing you've, you've seen or heard of someone using Docker for? Huh. Uh, lots of things from large scale to very small scale. I, I, I remember when I went to Oscon in Portland in 2013 or 14, uh, still very early in the project, and someone uh, from Mozilla took me to this bar, um, and they have this really cool setup where each keg, I forget the name, each, each keg has a little electronic display showing uh, how much of it is left and, you know, if there's bubbles still in it or something. And then they have all of this as internet connected and they have an API, which you can hit remotely to know, you know, when the new keg of your favorite beer <laughs> is, is, <laughs> awesome. is, is swapped in. And um, each keg is connected to uh, a little embedded computer with, with Docker on it. That's, that's the explanation I got. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's the absolute coolest, but it's, it's, it struck, it struck me at the time. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Hey, we also have one more quick question from the, uh, chat room. Uh, how long for the Docker on windows? Uh, so that's partially a question for Microsoft, but, um, <laughs> okay. we're, so it's a joint effort. Uh, you know, window Microsoft is working on container support in windows 10. And so obviously Docker can't run containers in windows without that in parallel. Uh, the core maintainers are working with uh, Microsoft engineers on the port to Windows. And Microsoft is doing most of the heavy lifting, and we're helping. Uh, okay. But they're, 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 they're really doing it. They're showing up on RC, upstream, sending patches like everyone else. It's pretty awesome to see. Uh, if the, if the, the teenager me, who is like the ultimate you know, anti-monopolist, anti, uh, uh, could see Microsoft engineer is working hand in hand with everyone else to send patches to a fully open source project. I would think my, it would probably blow my mind, but, uh, yeah. So the answer is probably, hopefully windows 10. That's the goal. Cool. Cool. And I would just thought of one more question. I got to stop doing that because we just got to wrap up pretty quick here, but, uh, are there eight, uh, uh, EC2 images that start with a Docker base? So I would just put my, my containers on top of that. Yeah. So, so my recommendation is to try out, uh, this project that we started called Docker machine. So if you go mm -hmm. on github.com slash docker slash machine, and that installs a little tool that will provision, basically it lets you go from zero to Docker on any cloud provider. So you can say Docker machine add, and you put your EC2 credentials, and it will spin up EC2 machines with Docker on it ready to go. And it will wow. pre-configure, it will, it will set up uh, SSL certificates so that you can have a secure connection. And then from that same machine, you can do Docker run, and it'll just work. Wow, so I that's a try that. That, that sounds great. That's an, and is there any question we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we let you go? Uh, you guys are pretty thorough. I mean, this, this, <laughs> is, this is great. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the show up on the RC channel. Uh, we really uh, need help and appreciate help. And, um, you know, we, we're figuring it out as we go. So we, we don't have all the answers. If you think we're doing something stupid or it's broken, Probably we know about it, but just in case, tell us, and we'll, we'll we'll try really hard to fix it. Very cool. And I have to ask my two required questions. I'm thinking of the answer to the first one. What's your favorite scripting language? My favorite scripting language? Uh, does Python count? <laughs> yeah, it'll have to, I, I guess. guess. <laughs> That's what I figured it would be, yes. It's got to be and, and and what uh, And what's your favorite uh, text editor? Uh, I use Vim. <sighs> uh, <laughs> Lost them both counts this time. <laughs> All right. I'm not, I'm not very religious about it. Uh, I used to use Emacs, and then... Uh, okay. My team said, hey, change to Vim. I said, okay, I'll try. 
Okay, and, and, and you never went back. Okay. Hey, no, uh, Solomon, it's, it's been wonderful having you on the show. We've, we've been in high anticipation of getting you on the show, and I know we've tried a couple times in the past to yeah, schedule out. It. Things don't work out. That's okay. Exactly. That's okay. We, you're on now. That's the important part. So thank you very much for giving us a, a bird's eye view and some good technical details about Docker, and I'm sure a lot more people are going to be aware of it now. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you. Thanks. That was uh, Solomon Hikes uh, uh, talking to us about Docker. What do you think, Gareth? Uh, I mean, it's, it it sounds really. It, it, I mean, I like we said at the start of the show. It, it's we've both been both been playing around with it, and it's it's really exciting. Um, I, I think it's one of those projects that's going to uh, kind of change the mentality and, and change how things are done um, across the board in terms of of deploying applications and just using uh, servers in general. Yeah, well, I think it's just ridiculous that every person that my current primary client has to build you know, from scratch, essentially, the VM that we're running, and then that changes day by day. And then we sometimes when we build, it doesn't work because something is wrong with our particular machine. And then the same thing has to happen on the integration machine, on the QA machines, and then even in deployment. We have eight primary web servers right now, big, big bladed web servers. And then we have to essentially do a source install for all the code that's changed since the last time that machine was updated. And that happens, uh, you know, two or three times a day. And it's really silly. So uh, I know the couple people in, inside the company are looking at Docker, and we, I've kind of been nudging them along that direction as well, uh, because you know it'd, be, it'd work easier on my on my uh, my Mac laptop, and it'd work easier to have the same exact binary build be progressed through all the different stages: our our QA machines, our testing machines, and staging machines, everything all the way down the line. So I, I'm sure that uh, I'll have more. Um, more energy now going back to work next Monday talking about Docker and getting things to work that way. So, And we could talk about this for hours, but we, we do have just a tiny bit of time left, so let me go ahead and finish up the show here, unless you have any last comments there, uh, Gareth. Nope, I'm I'm good. It was, uh, it was a really interesting show, and I'm, I'm glad we finally got uh, got the Docker guys on there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the upcoming, we have uh, only a couple shows scheduled right now, which means I'm going to send out a flurry of emails this weekend when I get a few minutes. Um, we have Randy Harper on next week. She's a, a frequent co-host of this show, but she's talking about this new uh, uh, organization she's got for online abuse prevention. It's a very important topic. Uh, there'll probably be some controversy about the things she has to say about it. I presume I'll be getting... Uh, both sides of the story from some of the chat room people. We'll see if we can interject some of that. But you have to not play softball with Randy, but she's she's ready for it. Uh, we also have Mohid. They were uh, supposed to be on last week, but uh, we had a cancellation. Uh, we had a, a, a network preemption. It happens every once in a while. Uh, me being the only show at 830 in the morning, sometimes uh, things go away. Um, Okay, so we've got that coming on, uh, and uh, nothing else scheduled right now, but if you go to the big spreadsheet, twitch.tv slash floss, you'll see us, uh, see what I've got working on or what I am working on to try to get more guests in there. Again, if you have a guest, if you have someone you want to hear on this show, the way to get that to happen is you email the project leader or however whoever represents the project and have them email me, merlin at stonehenge.com, and you will be on the short list. Okay, you can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. Uh, we also have an at Floss Weekly for Twitter. We have uh, do announcements uh, to both of those. We have a live chat. We took a number of questions from the live chat at live.twit.tv at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays when we tape this show. Uh, you can follow me at uh, Google Plus, Randall L. Scorch. Oh, I just bit my tongue. Ow. <laughs> bit my tongue on my own name. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce my name yet. And I'm also Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. Uh, I'll be at uh, Yapsi, North America, and uh, Salt Lake City coming up in early June. And we also have an important request. Every once in a while, the Twit uh, Network runs a survey. That's, I guess it's annual because that's what it says in my copy here. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes. Your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better, and we thank you for your continued support. And so without further ado, uh, uh, Gareth, thank you for helping with the, uh, today's show. Yeah, thanks oh, a lot, Randall. And, and Thank you, you for having plugs? us. I, I do yeah. not have anything to plug this okay. time, but if anyone okay. wants to follow my nonsensical ramblings on Twitter, I'm, I'm it's down in my lower third. Very good. And with that, we'll say we'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.